Good evening. I would like to talk about how technology can have a positive impact on our lives and our society. I've been in the tech industry for 29 years. I started in 1989 and 90 for a company was, that was called Compaq. And I'll talk about Compaq later on. It was the first company that brought a portable computer to the market. During that same year, I was also a student and I was on the wall in Berlin, October 1989, and I saw people with tears and fear in their eyes trying to cross a border after 28 years of no freedom. And that positive historic event was in many ways created partially also by technology. Of course, it was pushed by the Glasnost program of Gorbachev, but mobility and connectivity technology enabled that. And you might think, okay, this guy, 29 years ago, he started, I mean, was there any technology in 29 years ago, right? I can t tell you at that time, it certainly felt like really great technology, you know. But of course, it has no resemblance to what you have in your pocket or in your handbag, okay? But I can absolutely assure you what you have in your pockets today or in your handbag will very much look like this in a few years from now, okay? And that's what I want to talk about. I want to talk about very quickly about the history of technology. I will focus on computing technology and then a quick peek into the future. I'll try to avoid talking jargon and bruggles, uh, but I will talk about pizzas. Okay, so stay tuned. So just before we uh, before we start, when you think about us in this room, our friends, our family, our colleagues, we're all just a mere blink in the eye in terms of the evolution of mankind, which took 55 million years. And when you go back to our ancestors, the first ones that we could find 10 to 15 million years after the extinction of the dinosaurs, were really looking like squirrels. We were living in trees, okay? And when I then look at the computer technology first step, and of course, in terms of transformation, the technology didn't start 55 million years ago, but it went a little bit faster, but the transformational steps were also very significant, similar to the evolution of mankind. So probably the first date that you can find that is important is in 1937. There's a Bell Labs engineer with a couple of uh, lamps, bulbs, and a tobacco tin who started the first prototype of a computer, okay? The real first important computer was built by the university uh, in, in the US, I forgot the name of the university, 1943 to 1946 they built it. It needed 600 square meters, uh, weighed 50 tons and used 18,000 vacuum tubes. That computer operated for 10 years, until 1955, until lightning struck and the thing was destroyed. But when you think about that first computer, it did more calculations than the entire human race did until that very moment. So a very important step. If we then get into a next evolutionary step for humankind, we have to point to the Homo habilis. Homo habilis was two and a half million years ago. It was probably the first technologist because it actually started to use some stone tools. Okay? So it was the first real technical guy or lady. And I would say here from a technology perspective, I would bring in this company where I worked, Compaq Portable, the Compaq company and why was that product and that computer so essential as a transformational step in the technology world? Well, simply, first of all, it was a computer that was able to run software that non-engineers would understand, okay? But the most important thing, the thing weighed 18 iPads, okay? It was as big as a small child, but it had a handle. It had a handle, and that handle made a computer portable, okay? So in many ways, that computer is the great-great-grandmother of your smartphone in your pocket. Okay? If we move swiftly on to the next phase, Homo erectus. One and a half to 1.8 million years ago, what you start seeing here is the dimensions of a human being of today. So you have the arms a little bit shorter than the torso, and the legs normally a little bit longer than the torso. Why that? Out of the trees, on the ground. Okay? And we started to travel around a little bit and roam around a little bit from Africa to Europe. The next technology event that I would highlight is 29 years ago, March 1989, 
Sir Tim Berners-Lee produced the first concept for the internet. He wrote it down and it was the basis of the open internet today. Unbelievable that that internet today is serving 50% of the population. And streaming, searching, Googling, so many operations totally dependent on that first start in the internet. And by the way, the first e-commerce transaction apparently was a pizza, okay? It was ordered from Pizza Hut, and um, I don't think we can prove that, but <laughs> apparently it's the truth. But what is more important than that first pizza is the fact that during the same time, we start seeing mobile telecommunications coming up. 1G was in the 70s, 2G was really around this time when mobile voice started to democratize. And we start seeing the combination, the first combinations of phones and the internet. Then there was not a very good attempt to bring the internet to your smartphone and to your fingers, which was called 3G. Okay? It was not a great technology. Some of you may remember this Nokia WAP phone. And, and if, when you try to order a pizza on that, on that thing, it took you more time than actually going to the restaurant and getting it. But what is important is, and that's why it was so such an important transformation is. For the first time, we start seeing the internet and telecommunications converging and really delivering on a lot of very positive and important events in the society. The most important one, that people who were normally not connected, children, elderly, people with diseases, suddenly started to be connected to a real internet and be able to communicate and improve um, their lives. The next phase is obviously the famous Homo sapiens. Homo sapiens, in my view, the clear analogy here is moving from hardware to software. So we start having a Homo erectus with a big brain, right? And, and here from a technology perspective, the fact that suddenly we start seeing companies producing incredible applications, in particular social networking applications, Alibaba, Facebook, um, Apple, Google, Microsoft, you name it, you start getting these fantastic capabilities that truly transform industries and transform our personal lives. And more importantly, also actually trigger big events in the society. And the most important example of that is obviously the Arab Spring uprising that really was triggered by a social networking capability. And all of that on a 4G network, which is also very important to point out. So here we start getting a fast internet to all devices, enabling new applications, in particular visual applications, like video and TV. So where are we now? So now we double our data in our network every 15 months. And we start seeing really interesting new applications. And I can't talk about all of them, but the one that I think is really essential in our lives moving forward is robotics. And in robotics, when you start seeing what there is today, you have the funny robots, right? You have the Sony Ibo, the RoboDog. You seen it? Or the, the skier in the Winter Olympics in South Korea, a robot, right? And the one that I really like is the robot that cleans your barbecue, okay? Although, although nobody really knows how you clean the robot after that, work, but it's an interesting robot. But maybe more importantly than these, I would say, more gadgets, is the fact that robotics has the potential to really change healthcare. Okay? Uh, we start seeing it already today. The two most clearest examples are the replacement of, uh, of limbs, robotic limbs, that people have when they don't have um, the, uh, their own ones. And, and the second key example is, of course, uh, support for the elderly, which you can start seeing in Asia, where robots help in that, in that space. But that's today, and when you project that to tomorrow, I think the secret sauce in connecting robots and enabling some of the things that were talked about before is a technology called 5G. It's a new telecommunications technology. And what is 5G? I mean, 5G is, first of all, promises to be 10 times faster than 4G. But more important than the speed difference is <coughs> the fact that the response time of 5G is much, much better. 
And let me explain that very briefly. So your brain, or my brain, needs 40 milliseconds to tell my finger when it's in a cup of tea to get out of that cup of tea before I get a blister, okay? 40 milliseconds. The 5G network promises to be 40 times faster to deliver on one millisecond. That effectively means, or that prom makes, makes it possible to get robots, machines, flying taxis to interface with each other, to act and react to each other. That's the key interesting part of that technology. The second key thing about 5G is, according to the World Economic Forum, it has the opportunity, because of the latency, the speed and the capabilities, in combination with software, to fundamentally trigger a fourth industrial revolution. A revolution where countries that do not have the traditional industrial um, infrastructure are more on a level playing field as these technologies will change the production cycles and the end-to-end -end processes. And I think that's a really cool, positive thing if we can get countries that do not have stuff today to be more on a balancing point with the West. The key issue, though, with 5G is the rollout is quite challenging, in particular in this country, in Switzerland, because of regulation. But technically, it's hard because it works with airwaves that have a lot of interference. They're sensitive to interference. So they wouldn't, for example, be able to easily get into this building. There would be you know, interference from lamps, trees, cars, etc. So that is a real technical challenge that the community, the, the industry, tries to resolve. Now, when you look at all those technologies and you think a little bit more forward, where does it leave us as human beings? In fact, when I look back at the technology revolution over the many years that I've been in the industry, it has always been triggered by the individualization of tech. The reason that you like your phone in your pocket and not your fixed phone at home is because you have it in your pocket, because it has all your data, because it has your context. It is more intrinsic in your life. And that's the predominant evolution in tech over the last years. And that will continue. So my view is what could happen is that we end up as homo otiosum. Homo otiosum, Latin means lazy man. All right? All this tech doing everything for us. You maybe have seen a movie of Wally, -E, um, and that is a, gives you a very good picture. I don't think so, though. I do believe that we will become a more homo digitalis. And not in the sense, I mean, some of you who are in my age, they know this, you remember this movie, The Fly. The Fly was a famous movie where an engineer turns into a robotic fly. It all ends terrible and very badly, okay? That's not what I want to talk about when I say homo digitalis. What I mean is that through that latency of, of, of 5G, the new applications in robotics, we will be able to improve our capabilities quite significantly. Starting very simple with physical capabilities. There is already today in the planning from Hyundai a vest that you can wear which allows you to lift much more than 100 kilos without any problems. Okay? Uh, it's about, of course, healthcare, limbs that are maybe lost that you, that you replace. It's about becoming more efficient in your work through extra uh, intelligence and a faster reaction time through that. There are even companies, or it's actually university, it's not yet a company, University of Berkeley working on, on neural dust, which are sensors, intelligent sensors, connected sensors, that are so small and thin that they, they can interface with your body and your neural system. They can monitor your health, they can monitor your neuron, and they can probably repair problems that you may have. And the other most simple example, and I'm sure you have seen it already, there are literally people already walking around with sensors to pay, to open doors, and they have actually implanted them in their body. Okay? But I hope, you know, that the combination of that 
artificial or, or, or robotic intelligence with our biological intelligence, which makes us fundamentally more smarter and more resilient. It shouldn't be only about healthcare. It should really be about our intelligence. So that with that intelligence, we can start solving real world problems. Poverty, saving species, dealing with the energy problem, the waste problem, etc. Wouldn't that be the ultimate freedom that we can achieve with technology? Thank you.